sort of rounding us off um, is Ryan Corey from McCarris, and I'll let him um, give you more of an introduction um, to himself and his background, but um, he's going to talk to us about the market outlook for the organic dairy industry. So Ryan, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen shared here real quick. Let's see, I want to share this one here. All right. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, yeah, so as she mentioned, my name is Ryan Corey. I am the Director of Economics here at Macars. And a couple of quick words on exactly who is Macars. What we do is we specialize in providing market information for your non-GMO commodity sectors. Uh, historically, we focused primarily on the feed grains, the food grains, oil, uh, soybeans, wheat, things of that nature. But uh, most recently, we've actually really started to expand to the organic dairy sector. And so what I'm going to do today is show you some of that analysis that we recent, recently released, as well as provide you an outlook of where organic commodity prices are likely to go over this year. For anybody who may be interested in looking at some of our data more closely, we do provide a free farmer plan that anyone here is able to go access. Simply just go to macars.com farmers and you can access uh, a set of an account of your own, uh, get access to a bi-monthly report in which we release what we see going on in commodity prices, as well as get free access to our recently re released organic dairy analysis report that kind of highlights some key pieces of data and market trends over this past year. So with all the front matter out of the way, getting down to the nitty gritty of what we see going on in organic dairy markets. And the first thing that I would like to highlight that's really striking about this past year and has some major implications for this year is exactly what we saw occur with feed prices. And that would be the first significant divergence between corn and soybean prices in at least a decade. I think everyone here is probably pretty aware that over this past year, we've seen organic feed grade corn prices take a pretty big beating. While strangely, the soybean prices actually held up pretty strong. And the reason that we've seen this divergence is really important to kind of lay out at the beginning because it really kind of leads into a lot of the factors that we're going to talk about here. And ultimately, why we see these things to do these two things diverging is we are starting to see a fundamental shift in the supply picture. You know, I'm sure everyone here has heard and has read plenty of information about the supply of imports coming into the United States. And imports are a significant factor in the organic feed uh, market. But the story of imports has actually changed over the past several years. And when you talk about imports, it's no longer sufficient to just talk about imports. It's really what commodity you're talking about. If you kind of look at what we see going on with organic corn imports, you can see that back over the 15, 16 marketing year, we imported about 52% of our supplies. So that'd be a combination of imports and domestic production. So a little more than half of our organic corn supplies were sourced as imports. Over this past marketing year, you can see that it's actually declined to about 29%, which means that with respect to organic corn, we are becoming more successful at satisfying those demands with domestic supply. If we look at what's going on with soybeans, it's not quite as rosy as the picture. You can see that over that same 15, 16 marketing year, we had about 86% of our soybean supplies that were sourced as imports. Now that has dropped, but not nearly as substantially as what we've seen in corn. And over the 1920, this marketing year that just closed, we still imported 77% of our soybean needs. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we're seeing those gaps go different directions and we're not seeing soybeans close as quickly as corn, but the nuts and bolts of it is, whenever you look at what's going on with these commodity prices, ultimately what you have is markets that are being driven by two different factors. When you look at corn, what you're looking at is domestic supply is increasingly becoming the price driver. Because we are becoming increasingly less reliant on foreign markets, they're becoming a lesser factor in determining that price signal, and thus it's really the domestic supply that, that's really driving it. Conversely, if you look at soybeans, with 77% of our supply still dependent on foreign markets, what we do in the US in terms of production matters less. And what drives domestic prices more is going to be things like the value of the US dollar, freight, 
and what's going on with our foreign suppliers. And so that's one of those major fundamental factors in terms of when you look at the supply and demand of these markets that has just completely diverged over the past several years, that is creating two different markets for your two primary organic feed inputs. Starting off, taking some of those high level concepts and, and trying to work them into what does it mean when we talk about the marketing year that we're looking at, this 2021 marketing year. And when I say marketing year, I generally speak September through August because you know, I'm, a, I'm a corn soybean guy. That's what I generally watch. So when I think years, I think September, August. So when we look at the September, August marketing year, essentially the year ahead, starting off with what we see going on on a demand perspective. Principally, we're talking about feed demand because it continues to be the largest source of demand within the organic sector. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you look historically at what goes on within the organic sector, dairy has been the largest driver of feed demand. And with that, one trend that we've seen over the past several years, and, and it's a trend I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, growth in that industry just has not been very large. And even when we look at the 2021 marketing year, we don't expect to even achieve 1% growth in the overall size of the organic dairy herd over this year, which means that in terms of driving that demand growth within the feed grade sector, we're not expecting to see much drive or much growth resulting from dairy production. And as you look down through some of these other categories, beef, cattle, uh, hogs and pigs, you know, we're seeing growth and a relatively decent pace of growth, but the overall level of demand is just insignificant. You know, if you think about beef, most of that beef, if it is organic, is grass-fed. Very little grain is fed to those animals. So it really doesn't contribute to that overall feed picture. Uh, but when you start to talk about things like hay, it can have more of an impact. But even then, the scale of the industry is so small that it's fairly marginal. And then pigs as well, they're pretty small. So even with that 27% growth we're looking at, it doesn't translate into very much volume of growth. Which leaves us with the engine that's really been driving demand growth for about the past four years now, and that's poultry. Particularly up until about this past year, egg production and uh, broiler meat production. The, the growth we've seen within those has been pretty phenomenal. And as we look at the year ahead, we still expect to see continued growth in those sector, 2% for broilers and 1% for layers. One caveat that I'll lay out at this moment is these are numbers from a perspective we put together back in August. And as we sit now at the beginning of December, you know, things have changed. And when we look at layers on hand, we've actually seen that industry start to pick up some speed in terms of its growth. And if you look at the broiler situation, you know, since we put together these numbers, Bell and Evans has announced that they plan on significantly expanding their production in the latter half of 2021. So we could see additional growth and demand from those sectors. And then the third one here being turkey production. And over the past year, organic turkey production has expanded significantly. You know, and if we take these three categories and we kind of think about where we think our growth trends are going to be, overall, we see that, that poultry number growing by about 3%. So if we take all of our livestock things and we kind of try to stack them up to think about what they mean for feed demand, ultimately what we wind up with is a perspective where we think demand for feed grains is going to grow about 4%. And when I say feed grains, I'm principally talking about things like corn, uh, wheat, barley, things of that nature. High protein feed demand, uh, that's gonna be meals and soybeans, things of that such, they're grow, expected to grow at 7%. One kind of important thing to notice, and this is another one of those fundamental factors that's causing these markets to diverge is, you'll notice that protein is growing at a much faster rate than grain demand. And the reason for that is, the, the section of demand growth that used to be the large driver, which was dairy, has slowed down and has now been replaced by broilers and poultry in general and poultry eats a much higher percentage of protein in their diet ration. And so, so long as we see poultry continue to lead the demand growth curve, you're gonna likely continue to see protein demand outpace growth, outpace grain demand growth. Taking a little bit deeper dive into specifically what we've seen go on in organic dairy. And this is probably numbers that mean a heck of a lot more to you than when I'm talking about chickens and turkey. You know, I, I think everyone here is going to already kind of intuitively have guessed where these numbers are before I show them to you. But whenever we look at the number of organic dairy farms and what we do to get to this number is we just essentially take a few different pieces of survey based information, as well as the OID to get a perspective of how many certified organic dairy farms were certified at the close of the year. 
And we kind of take that as a barometer for how many existed on the DNA. It's not perfect because people come in, people come out, but you kind of have to take a point to get an idea of what the number is. But if we take that point, we can look at 2017 as kind of being the peak year. You know, we saw pretty a substantial expansion in demand ahead of that year, and supply just wasn't keeping up. And what we saw was in the 2016, 2017, we started to see that wave crest. In 2017, we really saw a plateau of growth in the size of the organic dairy industry. And with 18, we didn't really see any growth. Last year, we saw it retract a little bit. And then we look at this year, we're looking at a fairly significant retraction. And I believe, you know, we've heard some people hit on this point earlier in terms of the number of certified organic, uh, cert organic certifications that are lapsing this year and the lack of new operators coming in to replace those. And it's certainly showing up in the number of organic farms we expect to see by the end of this year. And that number is looking to approach where we were back in 2016. So, uh, you know, essentially by the close of this year, we expect we'll be about four years back in terms of growth in the number of operations within the United States. Somebody had asked earlier about exactly what does the geography of that growth look like and that retraction look like in terms of its distribution around the United States. And so kind of a quick guide on how you read this graph. Uh, the red and green indicate growth versus retraction. Anything that's gray is pretty much flat. And what we're looking at is growth since 2017, since that peak. What you can see is the areas that have expanded since 2017. You're looking at Texas, which I don't think anybody would find too entirely surprising. And then, you know, some other places further out west, Idaho, Utah. Uh, places that we've also seen growth are some places where historically we just haven't seen much organic dairy. And so those are kind of, in a sense, positive to see because you see the footprint of organic dairy increasing across the United States. Places like, uh, you know, Kentucky and South Carolina, uh, Florida, places where organic dairy just hasn't had a strong footprint historically. But offsetting those growth and leading to that general number that we're talking about in terms of declining organic dairy operations, you can see that there's a lot of states that are carrying red. Particularly when you look around the Great Lakes, uh, you know, if, if you look at Wisconsin, Wisconsin's declining fairly significantly in terms of the number of operations, uh, stretching all the way from Maine all the way through uh, Minnesota, really, we're seeing reduction. And then even along the West Coast, California has seen some reduction, uh, Washington, Oregon. You know, in, in general, what we're seeing is, you know, some of the smaller operations are going out, which is leading to a reduction in the number of head. But also, we've seen some larger operators close up. Uh, places like California and even New Mexico, where we primarily see large organic dairy operations, we've seen some retraction there. And so we're kind of in this point now where, you know, the landscape of organic dairy is expanding across the United States. But at the same time, it's causing the market to become spread thinner and also become more concentrated in new areas, which is causing some growing pains and some retraction in other places. So taking what we just talked about in terms of that overall perspective and, and what we have for growth and retraction in the number of farms and where we see dairy inventories located, really what we're talking about is for the 2021, or for the close of 2020 rather, we're looking for the number of organic dairy cows in the United States to decline to about 409,000 head, which is about a three-year low. Organic milk production following that retraction, we're expecting it to be down about 1% year over year. Now that I fed you guys all of that really negative information, you know, I will say that one thing that is somewhat heartening whenever you take those numbers and you put them in the context of some other stuff that we'll talk about, particularly the consumer demand and feed prices, we do actually start to look at the possibility for growth by the end of 2021. So one of those things that we could think could potentially lead to growth, number one being feed prices. Uh, everyone knows that feed prices are looking a little bit lower as we start this year compared last year. And to kind of give you a sense of where we think those prices might go, starting off looking at corn, what we're talking about is in the U.S. we're looking at about 9% more organic corn production this year. And really that's being driven by a combination of more acres and better yields. Uh, we're looking for that increase in production to drive imports lower again this year, following that reduced trend of the demand for imports. When I think about, you know, what are the kind of the risks around that supply outlook, 
and where if potentially organic price might find a floor or rebound. You know, one big factor is we started the 1920 marketing year with a whole lot of corn sitting in silos and just held over from the previous marketing year. And that perspective has dried up. Uh, I, I used to say that there was a risk of seeing lower yields, but at this point we're in December and we pretty know what our yields are and we know they are pretty good. So really from a supply perspective, that's what you're talking about, potentially for the reduction in imports and we're starting off with less corn on hand, which could help tighten up that floor. Why prices might not push higher? You know, at this point, really what we're talking about is import risk, though I think that that's pretty marginal. Uh, we do think we have pretty good corn supplies. So really what I think we're talking about in terms of risk is maybe more downside than uh, upside, but more moderate in terms of flat. Where that puts maybe corn price perspective overall, putting this in the idea of total numbers, if we look at this marketing year, the organic delivered corn price and this is delivered to the U.S. Corn Belt. I apologize, I can't give you a better regional price for the Northeast. But we were looking at 680 per bushel, which is down about 247 a bushel from the prior year. And with that, the premium over conventional fell by about 70 cents. If I talk about, you know, coming back to those risk points where I think this kind of puts price over this next year, you know, the, the big risks are number one, demand so long as we can maintain or, or maybe even exceed those demand expectations and, and keep you know, that feed demand perspective on there, that will keep prices from sinking too much lower. But also I believe that with corn supply sitting where they are, and they are still pretty good with an overall pretty decent US harvest, it's hard to see much upward pressure on prices. Overall, I think what you're looking at is more sideways position for organic corn prices over this year with a price floor probably around six to 650 per bushel. Uh, not to say it can't go lower than that, but I would be pretty surprised at this point if we see too much more downward pressure, particularly with what we know harvest was and the trend that imports are taking. Taking a quick glimpse into soybeans. Soybeans, you know, from a production perspective, look even better, up 12% year over year. And really, again, the story is we have more acres coming out this year and better yields. And with that 12% increase in production year over year, that's adding about 1 million bushels to the overall U.S. supply position. One thing that's really interesting to look at with soybeans is even with that increased U.S. supply position, we're still looking at higher imports. And you know the things that are driving those higher imports remain the factor that even with that growth in production, we definitely have growth in demand that's exceeding that. And that's liable to lead to more expansion in those imports. Kind of parsing those imports because it's important to kind of split your soybean, soy imports into beans and whole and, and from into beans and meal. When we look at what could potentially happen with soybean imports, what we're talking about is really two things. And the first one being continued expansion in imports from Argentina. Over this past year, really, we saw Argentina emerge and become the largest supplier of organic soybeans in the United States. And what that is, is that's a reflection uh, of the trend with respect to who imports soybeans and their preference shifting away from the Black Sea region to Argentina where it's much easier to control the supply chain and to have a higher level of certainty in terms of the quality of the product that you're importing. You know, it's essentially, it's a move to get away from the stigma and the risk of importing from the Black Sea region. Uh, the other big factor being Russia. And what you can see is over the prior marketing year, Russia over 1819, we imported somewhere around 300,000 uh, bushels of soybeans. Last year, we imported about 2.8 million bushels. Russia exploded. Well, a lot of that explosion in Russia is following a reduction in the Black Sea. Uh, it's some combination of either imports now, you know, coming out of Russia and people again shifting preference towards Russia. And so when we look at where that could put soybean imports this year, it's really a question of how much more can Argentina grab the U.S. market. And with some increased demand, I think they can grab more of the U.S. market and Russia taking more market share away from the Black Sea. Looking at soybean meal, soybean meal is a little bit of a different story. Uh, one of the really interesting things that we saw the last year was, if you look at the rate of imports from India, because India is the major uh, factor we're talking about here. Over 1920, we imported about 292,000 from India, which is up from what we imported over 18. What we also saw last year was April through June, imports from India declined about 19% year over year following COVID and following substantial port issues within that country. 
So despite the fact that for essentially a quarter of last year, imports ran at about a 20% deficit year over year, we still increased the number of imports from India. So when I look at the potential for soybean meal imports this year, really all I have to do is imagine a year in which India doesn't have any port issues, at least nothing similar to what they had last year. And that already puts you in a camp for increased soybean meal imports from India. You couple that with, again, coming back to the demand perspective, where we see feed demand continue to, to grow at a pretty robust pace. And, and it's really continued expansion of imports from India that are going to drive that increased meal import outlook. Coming around and, and wrapping this up with, oh, well, going into soybean prices real quick. When I look at soybean prices, you know, the domestic supply position with 12% more production, that's great. But what I come back around to is, again, whenever nearly 80% of your market is being sourced from foreign supplies, then it's really going to be those foreign factors. And what I look, look for in terms of price risk for soybeans is, and number one, worrying about consumer demand domestically. So long as U.S. consumers continue to prefer organic goods and keep dollars in grocery stores, and we don't see a major economic downturn, then we're very likely to see you know, our growth expectations be hit, if not exceeded. Uh, in addition to that, so long as the pace of imports stay pretty well in pace with what we're looking at now, then that gives us a place where soybeans will probably continue to bump along to $20 to $21 per bushel. The risk of much higher prices would really come from some major disruption to imports. And we saw that last year with COVID. However, at the pace things are taking now, it doesn't appear that we're likely to see any kind of significant disruption to ports. And you know, foreign supplies look pretty, pretty good at the moment. So I don't think we're gonna see any real cut from foreign suppliers any, adding any kind of upward pressure to price. Anything that could add potential downward pressure to price, again, we're talking about domestic demand and what could potentially happen there. And, you know, I'm not going to say that there is no risk, but so far the U.S. economy has held up well and consumers remain very interested in organic products, if anything, more interested than they were prior to COVID. And so that's liable to keep the demand side in check. So I think that we'll probably see prices continue to bump along in the price range that we're at now, somewhere around $20 to $21 per bushel, which is up a little bit from where we were last year, but not likely to see any kind of, you know, astronomic gains or any kind of significant undercutting of prices over this year. Quickly touching on wheat, and wheat's a little bit less interesting. The, the story with wheat is, in general, we just have more organic wheat in the United States this year than we did the last year. Generally, we're looking at higher acres. Uh, both here in the, the Midwest where I am, which is where a lot of your food grade wheat comes from, as well as when you look towards the uh, Northwest where a lot of your food grade production is. We're just looking at more acres and generally better yields. If we look at what we look, we're looking for in terms of winter wheat, we're looking at about 4% more production this year, uh, about 9% more spring wheat and 23% more durum. And so in general, just a better supply position and the overall quality of the wheat looks better this year than did last year. So if we take that and we put it into what we're thinking about for wheat prices and what that could mean, starting off with feed wheat, you know, so long as the organic corn, feed corn market stays depressed, feed grade wheat prices are going to follow suit because that's really what drives the feed wheat price. Looking at food grade though, you know, we did see a rebound in the third quarter of this year right ahead of, uh, you know, fall harvest, but with fall harvest, everything looks great and we've started to see some downward pressure on prices and, and we're starting to see a market that's becoming a little bit long. So we're likely to see prices, price pressure start to build as we move through this year and these prices trend a little bit lower as we move through 2021. So wrapping up the three big implications. Number one, the U.S. supply outlook looks strong. U.S. production's up pretty well and uh, in general the you know, I don't think from a U.S. supply perspective, we have anything really that's going to shock us there. Imports remain risky, particularly as so long as COVID remains a risk and, you know, the value of the U.S. dollar remains tentative. But looking domestically, I think our big risk is what's going to happen with consumer demand. You know, will organic poultry production plateau this year and will we start to see that level off the way we've seen dairy or will it continue its pace of growth? Uh, will consumers over this next year continue to remain wary of restaurants and keep their dollars in grocery stores, which has been extremely beneficial for organics? And then at the end of the day, what will happen with the U.S. economy? You know, at the end of the day, organics do remain a premium product and consumers' willingness to purchase those remains dependent on the size of their pocketbook. And if we see some kind of significant economic retraction, then that could lead to a dampening of consumer demand and ultimately lead to reduced organic prices. 
And with that, uh, I think I've gone over by about a minute. I apologize for that, but I'll take any questions we might have. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was really interesting. And I actually have some questions, but I'll let um, anybody else who, who has a question um, jump into the, the chat. We have a few more minutes um, where we can take some questions specific to Ryan's um, presentation. Uh, maybe I'll get started and then if if others want to jump into the chat. So we've heard this issue of um, organic feed uh, come up a lot with the producers that we have talked about as we've um, started our project in the organic dairy industry. And, you know, both from the perspective of like the ability to get high quality feed um, for their, their um, farm um as well as the cost of of that feed and how much of their overall mm -hmm. production costs that that makes up and so i'm interested um in your perspective on you know sort of these um because we we import so many soybeans and and have in the past with with other commodities how the fluctuations in um, the other organic commodities, like the poultry that you were talking about, influence the ability of dairy farmers to access um, these these feeds. Yeah, absolutely. So you know what's really interesting is if you take the organic poultry producers, um, one of the big things that has been behind their growth has been consolidation and the emergence of large producers. Uh, I would like to say it was an expansion in, in, in smaller operations and more regional, but that, that generally doesn't seem to be the case. And with the expansion of large producers within the industry and, and really driving the growth there, what that has resulted in is more controlled supply chains. And that's a big part of why we see imports emerging as large as they have been. You know, price is a part of it, for sure. But in the conversations I've had with the folks who work on that side of the fence, generally they want to source domestic supply. Uh, and, and they do that as a first bid. But their primary concern is mostly what you said, quality and availability. And at the end of the day, making sure that their supply chains are locked in and making sure that they can keep the supply of feed rolling and keep production going because that matters most. You know, it, it really is a capacity game and, and a fixed capital game at the point. It is beneficial to them to source from foreign markets where they feel that they can have a better control over that supply. And that's, you know, if you look particularly at the soybean meal situation, uh, it used to be we imported a bunch of soybean meal from China and a bunch of soybean meal from like Turkey. Um, and it's pretty much gone. Uh, we don't import almost anything from China anymore. I think this year we imported maybe like a, a few hundred short tons. And what we import from Turkey continues to diminish as well. And the reason for that is you're able to go to India, essentially certify a crushing facility, set up a network with a bunch of farmers, and you can do it within a very, very short period of time because they are de facto organic. They weren't using conventional methods to start with. They were producing soybeans, the good old fashioned way to use a phrase. And so you can almost instantly certify these operations as organic and lock in a supply chain of meal, which is really what they want for feeding poultry. And then also you don't have to deal with soybean oil, which is a big problem within the soybean sector. Uh, soybean, organic soybean oil has a very weak market in the United States. And so it, it, a lot of people who are in soybean crutch have a hard time finding demand for that. Well, they cut the soybean oil situation out, of the, out entirely by just leaving it in India. It wasn't receiving a premium to begin with. So now you take soybean meal that you're maybe getting 284 and you can sell it for 700 and you don't really care that you're not making the margin on meal that, or on oil because you weren't making it before. And you know what, what that kind of does is unfortunately it takes some of the demand out of the U.S. market and, and that kind of stifles some of the growth. It, it, the demand is definitely there and I, and I may be rambling a little bit at this point and I, and I think maybe the kind of answer to your question is you know they go to the domestic market first to get what they can, but then they really focus on foreign supplies because that's able to ensure their supply chain and that's what matters. And so that kind of makes the domestic market second fiddle in some ways. And with that, it creates some opportunities for people to be go, able to go in there and do interesting things within the protein side of the market. The grain is a little less 
because it is such a much, much larger market and we do use, we import so much less, but and I'm not sure that I totally answered your question there, but yeah, it's, it is challenging. You know, it, it really is a game where trying to find protein feeds that maybe aren't soybeans are the good option because soybeans have lots of issues in their production anyways. And so that's, it's, it is a big problem and it's a big question, but I think it's one that there's a lot of opportunities in. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So um, Bay asks if you would be willing to put the um, link for the monthly newsletter um, or share that so that uh, folks can can sign up for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Macars.com slash farmers. You can go on there, set up your free farmer account, and uh, it'll get sent to your mailbox twice a month, the okay. first and third Tuesday of every month. Very valuable. Thank you so much. Okay, last call for questions um, for Ryan, and then we'll, you know, sort of open it back up to, to general questions or comments that anybody wants to um, put out there before we before we adjourn for today. Um, so Nate asks, how resilient do you feel the domestic organic cor corn and soybean industry is to climate change? I'd say more resilient than the conventional. And the reason for that is, you know, if, if you look at yields within those crops, one of the things that's interesting is good weather is not as good for organic, but bad weather is certainly not as bad. And the reason for that is, is organic operations, especially well-established organic operations, just have a much better soil bed to work from. They have much better friability in the soil, they have much more organic manner. They have that root bed that holds things in. Generally, you're using a cover crop, which helps retain moisture during dry periods. And so in general, the soil holds up better during bad periods, and so your crop does as well. Now, I also say, you know, we don't do as phenomenal during good periods because we don't use a lot of the genetics and a lot of the snake oil that you can use to get up to like 300 bushel an acre corn, uh, <laughs> which, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, you know, in general, what you see with organics is during bad periods of growth, you know, or during, during periods of bad weather, organic crop growth isn't as badly impacted as the conventional sector. Great, thank you. Okay, well, Ryan, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, very Absolutely. interesting stuff. Definitely, you know, you gotta kind of start at the be beginning and it all sort of flows to the downstream. So um, I think really interesting stuff that you presented today. Um, with that, I will go ahead and ask for any last questions. Um, I think we have many of the, the presenters still on with us at this point, but I'm, I can't guarantee we have everybody. So, but if anybody has any last questions or just points of conversation that you want to bring up um, before we end today, now is your time to do it. And you can either put that in the chat or we can um, unmute you or you can unmute yourself and um, we can go from there. This is Martin, maybe just sort of a request if anyone has any sort of, again, suggestions for research directions, specific needs that this project or other projects could address, let us know whether it's through chat now, it's through you talking or through sending Nicole, Rachel or me an email, any and all of these means will work. So any feedback you have on what a project like ours can do for the industry would be highly appreciated. We've got a lot of good ideas today, but the more the merrier. And um, you can see that Rachel just put up our contact information um, as well as our project website um, where you can find additional information. We didn't really delve too much into the specifics of our, our um, project today, but you can find more information there and you can um, you know, learn more about uh, quality and, and organic dairy products there. So, I do have something in the chat. Um, Tyler says, looking to expand or go to a new processor, what would be the best, best way to, to do that? So I don't know if we have some of our, um, our processor panelists still on or if anybody else wants to, to jump in there. Um, if we have a producer who wants to um, 
go to a new processor, what are the, what's the best way to, to go about that? I don't know, maybe is there, is there an opportunity um, to do that? I, I see we might still have some of our processors on. I'm not sure if they're um, able to, to chime in, but if there is a, um, okay, I think Gene just un, unmuted, so we'll let him go ahead. Yeah, so uh, to that would be the best to the neighborship. You cut out a little bit, Jean, but did you say um, to approach the, you know, sort of leadership of, of the processing group? Actually, Jean, if you wanted to just um, chat it in, that would be great because we're having a hard time with our connection with you. Kathy did um, chime in that she thinks it's a tough thing to do at this time. I think Jean's going to um, put his response in the chat box. Any other questions? I've got a question, you know, for Ryan um, about the dairy. Uh, you know, you talked about the dairy. You had a, the graph with the United States, with the different states, with cow numbers, and it was color coded. And, and again, what, what are the colors? The green to red uh, progression. What was that? Yeah. So the green to red would be gains versus losses. The green indicated states where we've seen expansion since the peak in 2017 versus the red is where we've seen retraction since the peak in 2017. And so the darker the intensity of the color indicating the more severe the retraction or the expansion. So, um, you know, Sarah talked about the loss of, or the downward trend. You talked about the downward trend of organic dairy farms in numbers. Um, we also mm -hmm. talked about origin of livestock and ramping up on big dairies and or the shift to larger organic dairies. Um, do you have a feel for the shift um, in the makeup of the, the herds across the country as far as herd size average or, you know, obviously more bigger herds are around, more smaller herds are going away. Yeah, you know, I think I, I, I do have those numbers. I don't have specific ones in front of me to quote. I apologize. Uh, if you want to follow up with me via email after this, I can probably give you some more specifics. But I think your intuitive response is spot on. You know, the places well, that we've seen are trying to. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And really, more importantly, would be the, the what that does to milk supply across the organic milk supply in particular across the US. Um, one would think with the shift to the larger, uh, basically the more intensive, more heavy grain feeding dairies that organic milk production supply would actually be increasing even with the same number of cows. And you showed that the number of cows was gonna go up slightly. So it seems to me that, that maybe organic supply is actually of milk supply, total milk supply. Is that figure out there? And is that actually going up? Yeah, so no, the... Uh... We expect total organic dairy cows to attract nationally, the number of organic dairy cows to attract this year down to 409,000 head, which if I recall, I think last year we were somewhere close to 420. I don't, again, I don't have that specific number in front of me, so I'm, not, I'm trying to pull that in memory, but I do know that we're talking about a decline in the number of dairy cows this year. Um, and, and that really is a shift in, and it's, a, it's both a shift in production areas and a consolidation, you know. You are having the number of farmers is declining faster than the number of cows because the average operation size is increasing. And the places where we're losing organic operations are places where we used to have smaller operations. Um, but also we're seeing some large operations close down, you know, we're, we're seeing 
and some loss in New Mexico and loss of some large operations in California. We are definitely seeing large operations come online, particularly when you look at somewhere like Texas. Uh, but then again, you're also seeing small operations pop up in places where we didn't used to have them. You know, it's it, it the, the the reality of the data is there's not a perfect narrative. Yes, it is true that we are seeing a decline in small operations because we are seeing a scale up of large operations. And the scale up of those large operations is being facilitated by the fact that you can bring cattle online quicker by using the conversion method as opposed to the last third gestation. So that is true. It is also true that we're seeing some large operations close while we're doing this consolidation. And we're also seeing small operations open up in states where we haven't seen organic production in the past. You know, the organic footprint is expanding because organic demand is expanding. And, you know, fluid milk is a very difficult thing to ship very far. Uh, but in terms of, you know, what that does for the overall fluid milk supply in the United States, it is declining. And we expect it to decline this year. I think 1% is what our number was for decline by the end of 2020. Uh, and when we look at next year, you know, are we going to see further decline? It's hard to say. I'm optimistic that the fact that consumer demand has been much better this past year, the farmer pay price is stabilized. I heard somebody quote 31 or 32 earlier today. Uh, we have an estimate of about 31, so it's pretty well in line with that. Feed prices are coming off. So there is a possibility of some improved profitability this year. Hopefully that will help to stabilize some of this reduction in organic dairy uh, operations in the United States but you still have to fight against that tide of consolidation. I mean, that's going to be a reality. So that's, that's the weird picture. You have consolidation occurring at the same time that you have expansion. It just depends on where you look geog geographically and what impact you're having geographically as well. So you basically see pretty steady, um, I mean, you see uh, in consumer demand increasing slightly, but production, uh, being fairly flat or, or, or maybe going up a little or, or, or going down? What do you see for production in, in relation to that demand? Yeah, I believe that, you know, over this next year, you'll see organic fluid milk production. I, I'd be hard pressed to say you'll see an increase. Uh, you're, you're liable to see it flat to down. Um, that consumer demand picture, the, the consumer demand thing gets kind of strange because when we talk about that organic fluid milk production number, you're talking fluid milk production on farms. So the questions are, how much of that is being imported as powder that we're not going to import for making products? How much of that was getting, you know, post dumped into conventional because you couldn't get it into organic markets easy enough? Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that happen post that on-farm production number to the actual supply of milk for fluid milk in grocery stores or even for making cheese or butter or yogurt. But yeah, and well, and, that, and that's part of my optimism, you know, is if you do see the situation in which you have lower feed prices and enhanced consumer demand, perhaps this year you'll see the industry be able to level off and that retraction will, won't occur or be severely mitigated. So that, that, that would be my answer to that, I think. Well, one of the things that's been striking about being in this industry for a while is that um, the big shifts are pretty much blindsiding everybody that, that you know, we had mm -hmm. growth and, and we couldn't keep up uh, supply with the demand for organic milk for so yeah. many years. And then when it came to us to a halt, it came to a crashing halt. And it just makes one wonder if if things can shift again uh, in either direction without people yeah, really no. seeing it. Absolutely. Things can always shift unexpectedly. And, you know, one of the things I think that has been worse for the organic sector has been the emergence of plant-based milks. Because if you look at the demand profile for organic, so much more of the market goes out in the form of fluid milk than if you look at conventional. And then at the flip side of the coin, the same consumer who's most likely to buy a plant-based milk was also the consumer most likely to buy organic milk. And so in two fronts, the organic is facing some demand pressure worse than the conventional uh, because of that, which just puts more onus and more impetus within the organic dairy sector to diversify that demand, find new ways. And, you know, somebody mentioned yogurt, you know, people only eat so much yogurt and at some point you hit the, where you're, you're just competing on price. You're not really growing your market anymore. And it's, it, it's one of those things. And I, I say this for the entire organic dairy sector. You know, I, I answer so many questions about acres and imports, and I think the questions around demand are not asked enough. 
that's what's going to drive corn, organic corn down to $5 a bushel. That's what's driven organic corn down to $6 a bushel. We focused on expanding acres and not enough on demand. And as a result, you have enough production now that your the economics are driving the price down. Demand, demand, demand would be the number one thing that I say is important for the organic sector if you look at the next five to 10 years. So speaking about demand, does anyone know um, what the relative proportion of organic fluid milk is that's sold as all, either ultra pasteurized UHT versus HTST? And whether there are any opportunities? Nope. I mean, my gut feeling is some of the ones produced by the bigger ones, the organic valleys is, is a lot of it is ultra pasteurized, while the ones that's small and, and local is um, HTST. And it's probably, I would guess it's a smaller volume, but I think I Kathy think made a good big. comment that, that, you know, organic and local come together. So I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity expanding that HTST organic uh, market and whether that's something to work on and then produce the right raw milk that can support extended shelf life HTST type products. Yeah, I think you're right on as far as the, um, you know, some of the like more long standing um, organic fluid companies like Organic Valley and Horizon and, and those guys um, are really solely processing um, ultra pasteurized organic fluid um, and the HTST seems to be more on the um, smaller, not small, I mean, more on the local um, scale. All right, do we have any other questions? Um, Anything from the production processing side or um, even research? If not, then I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We had a fantastic day, lots of really great speakers and participants and um, we just came away with a, a ton of um, great information and I really appreciate how uh, much interaction we had with our group here today. It really helped us to um, identify some of the key challenges and opportunities in the organic system um, from, you know, production uh, from, you know, feed and production through uh, retail and, and the consumer end. And we truly believe that um, the dairy industry is a, uh, needs to take a systems approach to um, the key challenges and opportunities. So uh, we're really glad to have you all here and, and truly thankful for your time today. Um, I do want to just mention real quick. So again, Rachel put up our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have um, additional thoughts or questions. As Martin said, if you think of, you know, areas of research in particular that are needs for the industry, that we would be happy to have those conversations. Mm -hmm.